It is a joy to be back with you again, Emmanuel Baptist Church in El Dorado, Arkansas. I believe this is my uh, third time to be here with you on a on a Sunday morning, and uh, it's a it has been a privilege every time. And I really hope that that didn't do permanent damage to uh, your guitar. Was it just a stand? Oh, just a stand. Those guitars can be pretty pricey, tough to fix. Um, barring any more, uh, okay, we're good. I'll keep going now. A lot of times when we come, we, we like to remind you that we are a part of a missionary team that serves Southern Baptist churches all over the state. And, and it's a joy to do that. We want you to know the different kinds of ministries that you are participating in, even though you may not think about it uh, on, a, on, a, on a weekly basis. And so we'll talk about uh, dental clinics and uh, college ministry. And, uh, and one of the things I just really <laughs> felt impressed to do this morning is to let you know that one of the things that we have spent a great deal of time doing over the last year is walking through with various churches and search teams and pastoral candidates uh, the kind of things that you are walking through as a body right now. Brothers and sisters, you are not alone. And, and please understand, I have zero insider information. God is my witness. So this has not motivated anything other than just the desire to give a word of encouragement. Oh my goodness, what's he going to say next? Um, the realities that there have been many months that have passed uh, since your last pastor left and you are waiting to identify and install your next pastor, that does not mean that something is wrong with you. It means that you, we are human and we need Jesus. Uh, when there are differences of opinion that may come up about different things and you don't know where to turn because there's no pastor to go to, um, that does not mean that something is inherently wrong with you. You are human. We approach life from different angles, different experiences, different backgrounds. We do the best we can. We need Jesus. Here's a word of encouragement. Ephesians 4, right there at the beginning of the passage. Uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians and encourages them to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now think about what that's saying. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That means at least two things. One, we don't manufacture unity, at least not spiritual unity. It's not something we can just manipulate and do anything like that. Second, Unity is the default position in any congregation where the Holy Spirit is leading. And so when there's disunity, the first thought we should have is, okay, um, what do I know to be true about this other person? And let, letting that shape the congregation or the, the conversation rather than well, we have a difference of opinion, something must be wrong. Sometimes the Lord will allow those kind, of those kind of things to come up just to see how willing we are to hit pause, turn toward Him. And it's a beautiful thing when we start off conversations on different sides of an opinion and then the Lord brings about unity and all of a sudden there's this wholeness and this flourishing and you walk away convinced that only God could have done that. Just want to encourage you. You are not alone in, in the waiting and trying to figure out how to do the, walk through the challenges. I'd, in, I'd encourage you to be really careful with uh, invoking the, well, the Lord is leading me to do, the Lord's telling me this. Unless, you've, unless it is directly from Scripture, be really careful with that. Instead, allow the Spirit to lead you in conversation, to listen. Uh, assume the best. But we live in a culture right now and it's just so in vogue to assume the worst about somebody based off of a little snippet of what they say. That's not the way God's people operate. 
God's people operate, one, with a heart yielded toward him, but then also, what do I know to be true about that person? I know that they genuinely love the Lord. They love this church. They want to see this church thrive. Okay, that's the same thing I desire. Could it be that, okay, how are we approaching this from different angles? And then patiently work together, ask the Lord to help you, and, and you know he desires to do that. We're seeing it all over the place. Churches, search teams, all of us. I was talking with one of your, one of your search members uh, earlier. If you don't feel this sense of being ill-equipped for the job, you shouldn't be in it. Hey, listen, it hits me every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday I feel in over my head. I don't have language to articulate the kind of glorious truth that's contained in this Bible. I have to rely upon wisdom and strength much greater than anything I can manufacture. And it's the same, listen, it's the same for your search team. It's the same for you as you parent. It's the same for you as you care for aging parents. It's the same for you as a student as you're walking through how to live righteously at school. We need more than what we offer ourselves. And that kind of actually leads into my message this morning. So praise the Lord for that. Thank you for enduring that. I can't say uh, that it was a, a word from the Lord. It could have been to you. But I just really want to encourage you with that this morning. We love, we love to answer your phone calls. We love to spend time with you. We love to listen to you. We love to encourage you. That's what we do. We help we listen. Sometimes we may have things to offer. Uh, sometimes we're just as clueless as you are. We've got a pastor friend in Memphis that is kind of a little bit of a mentor to me. And uh, he just retired from his church a couple of weeks ago. or He's going to be taking a role with the state convention there in Tennessee. One of the things he likes to say to his congregation, be encouraged by this. He likes to say, uh, if you knew how little that I know about what to do next you would pray more. Be encouraged. Pastors everywhere facing that. Your search team, pray for your search team. Pray for your staff. Know that they pray for you. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, in just a few moments, I want to take a look at verses 19 to 26. And here's the title of my message. I hope that when you walk out uh, these doors in just a little bit. Even if you've been a believer for a long time, maybe you walked in this morning and you don't know whether or not you are a follower of Jesus. This is my aim to help you discern how to get the most out of life and death. How to get the most out of life and death. The message from the world is that, that God is the perennial enemy of your happiness. And if you truly want to be happy, if you want to thrive in life, if you want to flourish, then you're going to have to bypass the Lord in order to get there. That's the world's message. Or reconstruct the Lord, manipulate the Lord to attempt to get him to do things that would benefit you most. And he is not a God that will be manipulated. And a God reconfigured or reconstructed is no God at all. He's just as much an idol as anything we create with our hands. That's the world's message. But the message of the Bible from beginning to end is that God desires for you to flourish in every regard. God's desire is that you thrive in, in such a way that it transcends mere circumstantial happiness. It is to be eternally, spiritually, deeply, transcendently happy in every respect to the point of bearing fruit that shows the true worth, the true value of God himself. The value of someone's life is not determined by how much money they have in the bank account. 
I'm really surprised nobody said amen to that. It's not determined by your status, your level of popularity within the church or at school or at work or in society. The value of someone's life is determined specifically by whatever it is that they fill it with. And so here's a statement that I'll make here and then I'll come back to at the end. Your life is as valuable as your greatest priority. Your life is as valuable as your greatest priority. And that's what makes the spirituality of the Apostle Paul so attractive because it was the kind of Christian experience that certainly influenced his life, but it influenced it so much that it spilled over into the way that he approached death as well. Now, it seems as if our attention has been ratcheted up a little bit lately on mortality, the brevity of life, and the challenges that exist all around us that serve as threats to our life. Paul addresses in, a, in an overarching sense the Christian's life, the Christian's death, how to get the most of them in this passage in Philippians. It's right there in the first chapter of Philippians. Paul has written this letter uh, back to the church that he loves so dearly. He reminds them of their partnership in gospel ministry up to that point. He reflects upon his current status. He's in prison. While he's in prison, he's in prison for preaching the gospel. And meanwhile, uh, some of his former opponents, those not just who were competing with him in the marketplace of Christian preaching, but these were people who were preaching uh, other ideas than Paul. They were even potentially jealous of him and trying to undercut his ministry. And Paul says, I'm not threatened by them. My only desire is that the gospel be preached. It doesn't matter if it's my mouth or theirs. As long as the true gospel is being preached, I'm great. I'm content. He then goes on and he transitions from thinking about the past and thinking about the present to thinking about the days ahead. And I would argue that the people who live best in this life uh, also take time to think about the one to come. Does my life now make sense in light of what is to come? If my desire down the road is that kind of eternal experience, does my life now echo realities that naturally lead to that? Or is there a disconnect? Here's what Paul says. Verse 19, he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this, he's talking about his imprisonment, will turn out for my deliverance because it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my, in my body. I don't know if you felt it before, that hot rush uh, of blood that seems to just shoot to your face when you realize that you've made a mistake, when you've dropped the ball and it's, and it feels in the moment to be disastrous. Maybe your heart starts racing. There's that sense of, of guilt, of, of fear, of shame. And Paul, Paul says that I will not at all be ashamed. But the other experience from that, I have boldness to say this, that at all times Christ will be honored in my body. So how do we guard against experiences of shame in our own life. It's to honor Christ. What does it mean to honor? When we, typically when we honor someone, we recognize them. So think of a, a scene when you've been to a banquet before and uh, someone is winning the uh, Citizen of the Year Award here in El Dorado. 
We don't just, they don't do a lottery drawing, I don't think, in El Dorado to determine who receives Citizen of the Year. Um, something has transpired in order for that recognition to be levied upon that person. Some kind of accomplishment. Uh, maybe there's a, a long-term period of faithfulness of 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Or maybe there was something so significant that happened in the last year that it was worthy of recognition before all of these people. And, and Paul is saying that Christ is recognized to be Christ with his character. Think of the character of Jesus. Think of some of your favorite stories of how Jesus interacted with people. The kind of work that he performed. How Jesus revealed himself to be large and in charge. And how was it that Paul said that Jesus is honored and recognized in AD 62? Through Paul. That means people had the opportunity to interact with Paul and walk away thinking more highly of Jesus. So the question for me at that point becomes, am I the kind of person, do I carry on the kind of conversations, do I work in such a way, does my five-year-old son think more highly of Jesus because of the way that I interact with him when something goes wrong at the dinner table? Now, none of us are ultimately defined by our weakest moment. Praise the Lord for that. But on a consistent basis, whole story of my life being told, do people think more highly of Jesus when they interact with me? And Paul even goes further to qualify that. He says, with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Well, not naturally, when we think about honoring Christ, we think about doing that with our life. But Paul gives just as much space to saying that Christ might be honored in the way that Paul dies. It's a different thought from us. We don't typically enjoy thinking about end-of-life kind of matters. We run from those. We tend to get more therapeutic rather than theological there were centuries past when pastors did a really, they spent a lot of time dealing with these kind of matters, preaching on end of life matters, uh, because they lived in times when there were perpetual plagues. You take, for instance, the Black Plague in London in uh, the latter part of the 17th century. Uh, one quarter of the population died within one year. Six months later, there was the Great London Fire that Killed many thousands more. They dealt, they were very well aware of their own mortality. And so one of the first devotional books that was written in Puritan England was a book called The Practice of Piety by a man named Lewis Bailey. Most of us don't know Lewis Bailey. Lewis Bailey uh, published this book in around 1611, 1613. And it was by far, other than, other than John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress... It was by far the most published book for the next 150 years. Everyone had a copy of The Practice of Piety. About 200, 250 pages long. He starts off in dealing with the character of God. He talks a little bit about the, uh, the importance of the Lord's Supper and baptism. How to live righteously before the Lord. How to parent. The last 25% of the book is how to honor God in your final days. They focused and meditated upon these things because they did not want to miss the opportunity to honor Christ in aging and dying. What does it say of Christ to serve faithfully in the church but in final years express great worry and concern and, 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 and panic and anxiety. What does that say of the care of the Lord? Is, is our salvation only a salvation that is beneficial while we live and have health? Or does it also have something to say about those end-of-life matters? And we know from Scripture 
that our salvation is full, it's eternal, it has something to say in all stages of life. And so Paul says, whether I'm living or dying, my desire is for Christ to be honored in my body. Here's his principle. Every family, every, churches have mission statements, families have uh, little sayings that they pass around. If mama's not happy, the customer is always... These little sayings, these principles that transfer from business to business, person to person, family to family. This is one of Paul's right here. You could easily take verse 21 and apply that. See it as this undergirding principle to a lot of what he writes about in his letters. Here it is. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I'm to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. It, it doesn't mean that I get to live on just to enjoy breathing more and accumulating more and doing more. There's a specific purpose to life. For me to live is Christ. To live is fruitful labor that echoes the character and the work of Jesus. He defines fruitful later labor just a little bit later. He says, uh, yet which I shall choose. I can't tell. I don't know if it's more beneficial for me to live or die. If I die, I get to do more work. It's more beneficial for other people. If I die, well, there's great gain there. I'm torn between the two. He says, I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Jesus. If I'm thinking selfishly, he says, I want to go be with Jesus. Typically, when faced with a scenario like this, you'll hear... Uh, you press it upon college students and young adults. Oh, Jesus, please don't come back until I get married. Oh, Jesus, please don't come back until uh, I'm able to have a child. Jesus, don't come back until uh, I get my student loans paid. Nobody ever says that. Nothing selfish for, for Paul here, he says, my desire is to depart me with Jesus. That's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. I can see how me continuing to live would be beneficial to you. And so convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Here's how he defines fruitful labor. So Paul says, for me to live is Christ... For me to live is fruitful labor. Here's how he defines it. If I'm going to live, it will be directed at your progress and joy in the faith. If I'm going to breathe another day, it will be to the end that you become more godly and you delight more in Jesus. That's why I live. And Jesus, if I can't live for that, take me. Paul would have looked at you in the eyes and said... I want to see you know the Lord more. I want to see you delight in Him more. That He be your joy. Not the stock market, not health, not relationships, not money. Do you delight in the Lord? And so Paul would work with the Philippian church and teach them in ways to see that, that joy escalate. And that godliness be manufactured in their life as they interact with the truth of God and by the Spirit of God are being transformed. He says, I want to do this so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. There it is. There is Paul. I love it. So that when you look at me, you'll see the work of Jesus. I don't want you to equate me with Jesus. I'm not trying to take Jesus' place. I don't want to be uh, on, on even par with him. But my desire is that you see broken, limited, sometimes discouraged, sometimes uh, wrong. What do you mean wrong? 
Paul was a sinner like you and me. He met the Philippians. He desired to go to Asia. He was just following the game plan. He wanted to see the gospel get to the next people. And so the next people were up in Asia. And apparently that's not where the Lord wanted him. And so he redirects him. And then he redirects him again. And he ends up in Philippi after picking up Luke. Philippi was not his first choice of the next destination. He was wrong. Gloriously. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, you know the passage. Verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that people will know that the surpassing worth is from God and not from us. But what does he say in the next few verses? He says we're distressed in every way. We're crushed. (laughs) We're pressed in on. Our plans are confounded. We're not finally discouraged or dismayed, but it's almost like we're almost there. It's, it's like on a daily basis there are, these little, there, there are these little deaths that happen. But there in that passage, Paul says, the more that happens, the more the life of Jesus gets to be reflected before you. I've got two points for you as we consider this. And the first of those is this, for the Christian. For any Christian, for every Christian, death is gain. For the Christian, death is gain. No one who dies in Christ loses. No one that dies in Christ does so with disappointment. To die in Christ is always only to gain. And it's just like the Lord to take that experience that so frightens and confuses and paralyzes and and demands our mental attention so much so that we can start, if we're not careful, we can interpret all of life through the lens of death. And it's just like the Lord to take what the enemy means to be an end and turn it into a beginning. We were not created to die. God made us to be these living representatives of His character, performing His works all over creation, Genesis chapter 1. We were made to relate with God. We were made to rely upon God to take what He has given and to live by that, not to bypass Him. We were made to represent God on earth as His images. So the people get to know what he's like by interacting with us. But it was specifically by bypassing God that Adam and Eve experienced the consequence of not relying upon God, not wanting to represent him, not relating first with him. They experienced death. He promised it'll happen. It did, but he, but he made this promise in Genesis 3, 15. One day I will send a deliverer who will overturn this curse that you are now enduring. It's promised. And so the whole Old Testament story tells the people that are, uh, it tells the story of a people that are burdened with this curse. They're waiting for this chosen one that would come and overturn it. But in the meantime, generation after generation after generation, whether we're godly or ungodly, we die. But here's the promise, Isaiah 25. He, speaking of this Messiah, will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people will take away, he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We've waited for him that he will save us. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. 
For years they knew this to be true. And when he finally showed up looking to be a man just as they were, many looked right past him. But yet salvation came at a certain point in history to God's people. They weren't prepared for him. We know him now to be this Messiah, Jesus. Romans chapter 5 tells us that Jesus reverses the curse of death and he actually turns it into a victory. He does this personally. He takes the greatest tragedy that we could experience and he turns it into a glorious triumph. Romans 5, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This Messiah, this chosen one, came to deliver and he did not do so wearing white gloves while rolling down the street in a hermetically sealed cart. He got down in the middle of it with us as a man. And he took the medicine himself and then rose up again and spit it out just to show that he was Lord even over death. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we're reconciled, will we be saved by his life. He reverses the curse personally. He reverses it eternally. Revelation 21 One of the last chapters of your Bible tells a story. We've looked at this many times, not understanding that it connects back to the promise that was already given in Isaiah chapter 25. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First heaven, first earth passed away. Sea was no more. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them just as he did in the opening chapters of the Bible. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more. Neither shall be mourning or crying or pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Jesus reverses this curse victoriously. This perishable body, 1 Corinthians 15, it's the one we deal with on a daily basis. It groans and creaks more and more as the days and years accumulate. It breaks down. We don't continue to grow. We start to shrink. We take on illnesses that we're not as quick to bounce back from. We wrinkle. We spot. It's our perishable body. And it must put on the imperishable. It must be glorified. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality... Then will come to pass the saying that is written that death is swallowed up in victory. At which point we say, death, where is your sting? Paul says, thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us personal victory over this curse. Victorious victory. Eternal victory. Which means, going back to Paul, death is Gain. He takes our, this thing that we see often as an end and turns it into a glorious beginning. I mentioned earlier Lewis Bailey. Some of his friends made these statements. Richard Sibbs, that through Christ, death becomes friendly to me. Thomas Watson, death is the funeral of all of our sorrows. Thomas Goodwin, ah, is this dying? Then how have I dreaded as an enemy this smiling friend? I love what Adoniram Judson said. Adoniram Judson was the first missionary from North America. He was Baptist. He said, when Christ calls me home, I will go with the gladness of a boy bounding away from school. Amen. No one's a loser when they die in Christ. To Paul, God help us. To us, death is gain. 
But it's only gain when Christ is life. Oh, how much I long for you to know that death is gain. And the only way that that's possible is for Christ to be life. Life. Not just give life, but to be life to you. And to define life for you. Second point. To the Christian... Death is gain, life is Christ. It may seem like a strange contradiction. Paul says in verse 21, to live is Christ. Shouldn't it be life is for Christ? Or life, uh, Christ maybe is life? No, Paul equates living with Jesus representing himself to the world around through Paul's mortal body. And so Galatians 2, chapter 2, Chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Here's four words. Christ lives in me. That is the foundational difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Does Christ live within you? And please understand this, he will not attempt to live in a totally different trajectory in 2021 than he did in this time that we read about in this book. He longs to represent his life, his character, his work through your limited existence. In other words, he says that to live... If I go on another day, then my desire is that Christ be, re- be represented in and through me. May I reflect character and values and strength and wisdom and joy and peace and ambition that is far greater than anything I could muster. Nothing less than the character and the ambition and the desire and the joy and the peace of Jesus. Nothing less than Him. And he describes life as fruitful labor. And so for Paul, he would say that he would desire to go on living for the glory of Christ and for the good of the church. I was thinking about that on the way here. Paul's ambition, glorify Christ, benefit the church. That's why I'm here. And his desire is to see more people incorporated into the church. He wants to see lost people saved. But that's it. Christ, the church. Take my breath if I'm not beneficial to the church or glorifying Christ. I wonder, how much longer would I go on? I want to ask you, how much longer would you be alive if you were allowed to live only for those two ambitions? Maybe the Lord gives us time to repent at times. We live in a very individualistic culture. We don't think much about the growth of the body. We prioritize our own. Maybe that's one of the reasons we experience the level of disunity that we do. We come together on Sundays... But much of our life and much of our growth is individual, independent from one another. That's not the way that they lived here. It's a fairly common invention. How long would you continue to breathe if you were allowed to live to glorify Jesus and to benefit the church? I don't think that I'm exaggerating. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, that Jesus died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And then he goes on to talk about how they are compelled to present the gospel to be ambassadors before every person with no distinction whatsoever, no discrimination. 
Which means, going back to the reason we were created, Christians are made to represent Jesus. You live to reflect Jesus. Which is also to say that Jesus' primary way, primary, means of showing the culture around El Dorado and beyond, His primary means is to be seen in the life of His church. That's His plan. As I spoke earlier, maybe instantly you feel overwhelmed and ill-equipped. Good. And because that's what causes us to rely upon His Holy Spirit to do the work. It's what keeps us humble from putting on airs. Like we've suddenly attained something that everybody else needs to work their way up to. No, we step in front of them just as broken and just as needy and just as limited which gives us opportunity to speak highly of the grace of God shown to us. We represent Jesus. We rely upon Jesus. You and I can't raise the dead, but Jesus specializes in it. He takes our common words, infuses them by His Holy Spirit, and He brings about resurrection in the lives of those we share the gospel with. We rely upon Jesus we, when we relate with Him. Death for the Christian is gain when Christ has been life. And so I ask you this morning, in thinking about Christ being life, please understand I'm not I'm not asking about a a one-time exchange of information with Him in a way to somehow guarantee an eternal destination. This is not just about going to heaven. It's about reflecting that He is Lord over eternal destination, yes, as well as this moment now. And the hopes and and dreams that I have after high school and after college. And the hopes and dreams that I have for my children and my grandchildren. And the hopes and dreams that I have for my parents. And what I want to accomplish at work is Jesus Master. In order for Him to be life, He must be Master. Is Jesus Master? Is He Lord? Is He Boss? Is He utmost authority if Jesus ain't happy nobody's happy that kind of boss is he model do you look at the life of Jesus and ask him to represent that through you that's what it means for him to be life for him to be master for him to be model for him to be the motivation it's not just so that you can you know do things and build up a spiritual resume that you can present at the pearly gates when you show up no he's the motivation This is to reflect well upon Him. Even if I have to be shown to be a fool. For Christ to be be life, He must be master, model, motivation. I want to ask you, if you... I'll finish with this. I said earlier, your life is as valuable as your greatest priority. For Paul, Christ was life, which means his life possessed utmost significance for himself and also for us, eternal significance, death-conquering kind of significance. But I wonder, and I ask myself this a few times in getting ready for this morning, if you were given the opportunity to write out on a sheet of paper For me to live is, and then there's a big blank. How would you finish the statement? Maybe we don't need to ask you. Maybe we need to ask your spouse. Or those you work with. You really want an honest answer? Ask the kids. I'm scared to know what my kids would put down. 
For dad to live is a nap. For dad to live is quiet. I wonder if my kids would say, for dad to live is Christ. Can you think about the kind of difference that would make in the life of a child? Just knowing how a dad or a mom would fill out that statement. How would you fill it out? Maybe ask the Holy Spirit. Would you speak to my heart? Would you take these words? Would you assess me by them? The beautiful truth about the Holy Spirit is that He does not come and speak to us in order to rub our nose in our deficiencies. All of the nose rubbing was performed on the cross. He also, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, that if you know the Lord, there's no condemnation for those who are already in Christ Jesus. His desire is not to scold you, but to woo you and delight you toward that which is better. So ask him this morning, how do you see me filling in that statement? For me to live is only when Christ is the answer. Is death truly gain? And what glorious gain there is. Would you pray with me? The worship team is going to come and lead us in a song of response. And as they do that, I just kindly want to ask you to, to ask the Lord to speak to your heart now as we prepare to respond and then to leave. Thank you for your attention. You've been so gracious. Again. Where do you stand this morning with the Lord? I want to ask you, do you truly know Him? In 2003, I met a girl that I began to learn some basic bits of information about but I only knew about her it was in courting and dating becoming engaged and marrying Jenny McCalman that I truly began to know her I'm not asking what you know about the Lord it's possible for somebody to have thousands of Bible verses memorized but still not truly know the Lord in their heart and be transformed by Him. Bible knowledge may be life. Church attendance may be life. Christian service may be life. But is Christ life? He extends Himself to you this morning and asks you to simply repent and believe. To turn from sin, from independence, from doing things your way and to trust wholeheartedly that He alone is righteous. He alone is capable of forgiving sin. He alone can save. And so when you hope in Him, your hope is well placed. Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life that you and I could never live and died on a cross for, our, for the forgiveness of our sin. He was then buried and died but rose victoriously from the grave proving that He is God, proving that He can forgive sin, proving He can reverse the curse of death, proving that He can grant eternal life, proving that He can restore you. He can restore the brokenness in your life. He can restore the emptiness. He can, he can take away uh, the chaos and bring peace. He can take away the dread and give joy. He alone is the sufficiency that we so desperately long for. Would you turn to Him and would you trust? Maybe you realize this morning that something has been off, your priorities have been out of line and you just need to just exhale and start over. Would you do that by the help of the Lord? I'm going to be down on the front row and I don't know how comfortable you are or how 
how often you respond during invitations here at the church. If you desire to join hands with another believer and come to these steps and pray for one another and pray for the church, I would encourage you to feel free to do that. If you don't know whether or not you know the Lord, I would love to pray with you. And I know that there's other members here in the church that would love to pray with you. If you want to kneel at your seat, if you want to grab your family there and surround them. Dads, if you want to look down at your kids, look at your wife and say, I don't know what it's been up to this point. But I know that from now on, for me to live is Christ. What kind of trajectory could be set for families? Dads and moms, students would make that their their statement, their ambition. Father, we thank you for our time. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Help us to respond in the way that you desire for us to. Oh, Jesus. You truly would you be life to us we love you and we thank you you are better than we've imagined we pray this for your sake amen